Tom and I enjoy having kebabs on the grill. Meat, fresh veggies, and mushrooms on skewers are just excellent and make a great meal for us. I can grow the veggies, but I know zilch about growing mushrooms. Likewise, Gordon, who is on our Prairie Yard and Garden production crew, is really good with wood and carves beautiful wooden spoons. Gordon and I are going to enjoy learning with today's guest and hope you will too. Come and see what I mean. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided by Heartland Motor Company, providing service to Minnesota and the Dakotas for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA, pioneers in bringing state-of-the-art technology to our rural communities. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. And by friends of Prairie Yard and Garden, a community of supporters like you who engage in the long-term growth of the series. To become a friend of Prairie Yard and Garden, visit pioneer.org forward slash PYG. friends from the South Dakota Master Gardeners group suggested visiting Hackberry Hollow to do a show. I did some research and found that Jerry Ward, the owner of Hackberry Hollow, enjoys fruits. First he has trees with fruits, second he has fruits of mushrooms growing from his logs, and finally he has the fruit of his labor making wood products from the trees harvested on his land. Thanks, Jerry, for letting us come to visit. You're welcome. First of all, tell us about your background. I was a general contractor for 20 years in Sioux Falls. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Colorado and we raised fruit there. But here you can actually raise more than you can in Colorado. Uh, even though we have such cold winters, we don't get the, the winter kill that we did in Colorado. And then of course we got the, such rich soil here. It's, it's almost like tropical, what you can do in about four or five months, you know. How did you establish, or when did you establish Hackberry Hollow? Uh, well, we bought the farm here in 92, and I had a pretty good sized garden, but then we actually started an LLC in 2002 called Hackberry Hollow LLC raising quite a bit of produce then and still in the business, in the construction business. And uh, had to deal with family items in Colorado when my dad passed away. Going back and forth, I ended up just uh, closing the company down, selling all the equipment and decided I would try the, oh, 10 years of uh, uh, farmer's market at the Falls Park Farmer's Market. And it was fun, but, but uh, and it's, I love growing stuff. It's, we joke about it, some of the old friends down there. It's like a sickness that you can't get out of your system, you know. But I still raise a lot of stuff, even though I quit the market in uh, 16, I guess it was. How did you pick the name Hackberry Hollow? Well, we're down in the bottom here on a gravel road, and uh, it's like a hollow down in the south. And we have a lot of big hackberry trees here. In fact, we have the largest hackberry tree in the back field on the whole Big Sioux River system. What kind of fruits do you grow here? Raspberries, uh, we've got, in the tree fruit, we've got uh, cherries, uh, ronia berries, um, apricots, pears, apples, mostly apples and pears. Yeah, we get frost later than Sioux Falls does, which is only five miles away because we're in the river bottom. 
So there's been a many a times I've covered little trees, you know, but you just got to take it the way it is. That's what nature deals out, you know, so. Jerry, do you ever have trouble with pollination at all? Uh, the only thing I have problems with are the uh, pears. Pears normally bloom before apples, and then some years everything ends up, ends up blooming at the same time. This year that happened. Well, this year everything bloomed right at the end of April, including the apples. What has happened is there's so many uh, blossoms that the bees have to choose from. Since uh, pear blossoms have no fragrance, the bees are not attracted to those trees. They go to the ones that smell good, like the apples and uh, all the other ones. You know, they've got a good fragrance. So they just skip all of my pear trees. This year I've got maybe 200 pears out of five trees, and I should have about oh, 20 bushel. So that's the way it is. In order to be uh, certified uh, naturally grown, you can't use any of the normal fruit tree sprays that, that a lot of people use. And uh, so what I did for a while was I would try the jugs, vinegar, and then the sugar water in it. And that worked good for drawing some coddling moths to it. But what we found on some of my trees, you can still see a red ball hanging here and there. And we'd take the red ball in the spring and put uh, Tanglefoot's what we would put on there. And if you put it out right after the bloom stage and the little fruit is just starting, that's, that's perfect timing. And, and they think, well, when the moths come around, they think that's an apple. Well, that worked pretty good for a while. And I used to not have very many uh, insect problems or disease problems, but I started raising Honeycrisp apples. And Honeycrisp are the, about the most delicate apple I've ever raised. They're just susceptible to every bug and every worm you can think of uh, and disease. But the, the tangle foot on the ball seems to work the best. What do you do with all of your harvest? Well, being that I don't, I'm not in the market anymore, um, there's a young gal nearby and she has an online farmer's market. And uh, it's called Glory Garden and it's pretty cool. She gets orders online and takes the orders in there every Tuesday. So tomorrow she's going to deliver. Do you find that your trees will produce heavy one year and then rest another year? Certain varieties. Uh, beyond this tree, there's two trees back there that are Harold Red. They're like the, the Harrelson apple. Well, and Cortland too. Both those are really good for uh, apple pies. You know, they're tart. And the Cortland, he produced, he was super heavy last year. He's only got maybe 50 apples on him. And those over there, they're not producing like they did last year. So it's just certain varieties that that happens to. This guy, he produces consistently every year. And you would think he would take a break like some of them do, but no. I would like to learn about your mushrooms now. Can we go learn about those? I suppose. Mary, this is where we raise our shiitake mushrooms. These are maple logs that we've inoculated with the mycelium that we get from Wisconsin. Uh, these are four and five years old. The maple logs here we inoculated this spring, and those are a, a whole new variety of shiitake that I've never raised before. They're supposed to be even more prolific than these. And then this one here, uh, we use willow logs for the uh, um, oyster mushrooms. And these are particular uh, mushrooms are called pohu, and they're one of the most productive ones that I've ever had. We've, ra we've tried about oh, six different varieties of, of uh, oyster mushrooms, even golden ones, and then there's orange ones. But these guys are fantastic. And if you like shiitake mushrooms, these guys actually have a better flavor than the shiitakes. I always thought to grow mushrooms, you had to have it in a complete dark area. No, 
it helps those, all these maple trees here shade this in the summer because if I didn't have the shade, then I, what I would have to do is palletize all of these guys, cover them up with uh, some kind of a cloth, wet it every day. What these need to produce is about an inch of rain per week. And since we don't have that, and this year especially it's so dry, I've had to water these down. I started watering these guys last week, and then finally I got little teeny pins, they're called, P-I-N-S, that came out on the shiitakes. And now you can see we got a harvest of maybe hmm, four pounds right there. As far as harvesting these guys, at the perfect stage you want them is when they're just opened up, just not flat, but before that stage, because they have the best flavor. And they're, most times they're at their peak size that they're gonna get. Some of these guys will get as big as plates. Why do we have the little metal tags on these? Springtime, we put these on whenever we do a pallet. But we put these on and we tell what it is. Like this one is a double jewel. This is a five of 17. So this one is, he's three years old. And uh, he, whenever they get light, because the first year they're really heavy because of all that sap that's still in the, the log, they will produce up to five years. First of all, we drill holes in it and you want them to be ever six inches apart. And like a, like a typical log, see this one, he's, he's pretty well spent. But I bet there's 80 holes in this guy, 65 to 80 holes. We go in about an inch. And then you use the plunger thing, you, you uh, poke it into the mycelium, which is, they put the, the mycelium, the mushroom spores into a sawdust and the, they say the, the best wood for that is to put it back in oak. Well, we don't have oak here. So the next best thing is to use the hardwood maple or even the soft maples. And we've put them in uh, mulberry, we put them in uh, hackberry, and even box elder, and they do produce. So in the spring of the year, mm -hmm. you get the inoculant in. Right. And when do you put them in? Like, at what time of the year? Well, you need to cut your wood. Um, they say cut it in the winter time if it's a real cold climate and let them sit. But the, the minimum you need is like two weeks. So I cut my logs, my maple trees, just like these guys here, little ones, three, uh, three up to eight inches. We cut those, do them in about 40 inch long pieces and uh, let them sit for a minimum of two weeks or up to a month and then that's when they, they will take off. Uh, when we inoculate these, you can see these spots where there's wax there. We have to cover the, um, the mycelium with the wax to keep insects and different critters out of it. Uh, candle wax or uh, beeswax work good too. And we, we purchased that from the same folks that we get this from. And then the mushrooms will grow right through that wax? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they come right back up. You can see the, uh, they just started popping this morning on the pohu oyster mushrooms. They're just, they just come right back that hole. So if there's ever any doubt what's coming up, what kind of strange fun fungi this is, if it's in a pattern, it's those holes, it's good. So. How do you know when to harvest these guys? These guys should be opened up to the point that they're no longer like a hamburger bun, but they should be just about to flatten out. Perfect, perfect one would be these guys here. This one, tomorrow he'd probably be a little better, but, but he's awful good like that. Uh, and, and typically, on, if you've never had uh, shiitakes before, you need to, uh, or what I do is I just split them like this to cook them and then take the stem out. The stem is the only thing that's really tough on these guys. I have a good friend, he's a head chef for Avera the Hospital in town and uh, he cooks for all these folks that, that come to their different functions and he takes all of these guys and he puts them in a blender real fine and he said, Jerry, you've never had 
mushroom soup till you've had from the stems. It's got the most fantastic flavor. So he uses all of it, but most people, you just throw them away because they're just too tough. But this part, it's wonderful. And then what I do is I divide them up, just split them like that. They never have bugs. Just make sure they're clean and then uh, fry them. Do you wash these when no. you take them in? Well, you can wash them just before you cook them, but they're just going to soak up water. So you just want to clean all the stuff off. I would never recommend eating these raw. We eat them between the kids, the grandkids, give them to the neighbors. Uh, I used to supply a couple restaurants in town, but the problem is most chefs, and I'm not knocking them, but most chefs wanted a certain time, and God's got a different time with nature, you know. And I can't predict exactly when these guys will, will produce. How long do they last? I mean, how long do they keep? Well, if you put them in a paper bag and just spritz them with a little bit of water, they'll keep in the fridge for up to a month. This is so interesting to me, because like I said, I know nothing about mushrooms. Oh, they're good. But now I want to find out about your wood products too. Can we see what you make? Yeah, you bet. I'd be glad to show you. I have a question. How would I set up a bird feeding station in my yard? The important thing to remember is that birds need water and they also need cover. So you need to have some kind of a watering system, whether it's a little pond, uh, whether it's a, a fountain, whatever you can find for water for the birds. That's number one. Also, set your feeders up near shrubs or trees so that the birds feel comfortable moving back and forth. They want to stay away from predators, they want to watch for predators, so make sure that they, stay, they, they have a place where they can stay and feel comfortable. I use a multiple number of feeders and what I first like to do is get a shepherd's hook. This is the shepherd's hook here and it's really important to, to get a good baffle. The baffles protect the bird seed and the bird feeders from the squirrels and the raccoons. The squirrels, raccoons, of course, like to crawl up something like this and will clean your feeder out very quickly. So the baffles are a key ingredient to having a good feeding station. Uh, these typically would be for cardinals, blue jays, uh, the finches, uh, uh, probably 25 to 30 different species of birds that come throughout the year would use these feeders. Uh, this one is designed uh, to keep squirrels away. And what happens when the squirrel comes, they jump on here and it closes the feeding holes. So this is a, a, a neat little feeder. It's uh, smaller, so you need to fill, fill it more often, but it will be effective. And, in, uh, and you really don't need the baffle if you have, have a little feeder like this. Now the other one, the larger feeder, the idea here is to have the squirrel flip off when they come. They'll, they try to put their paws on there and they'll actually flip off because it's too heavy, but it's not so heavy that the birds will, will flip off. The seed I use here, and you can make your own seed. Uh, you can make your own mix. You can buy it at the stores too, uh, whatever kind of mix you like. I find the birds really like the medium chip sunflower seeds, the cracked corn, and the brown safflower seeds. So I just take a pail, put them in and mix them up and, and fill my feeders that way. These are just two of the ways that we can feed birds. But uh, we, if you want a good population of birds coming to your feeders, this is a good start right here. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chaska, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Jerry, when did you get started doing wood products? Um, I started about the time that I got out of the produce business at the farmer's market. We use just the woods that are from our farm here. Uh, maple, walnut, honey locust, uh, hackberry, uh, ash is, a, is another one. We haven't done a lot of stuff with ash, but, and then also this base right here, that's uh, everybody's favorite, it's called buckthorn. It's a, it's a weed, it's, a, it's an invasive species, and I have a lot of it in the backwoods, but every now and then I find one big enough to make a base out of, to make a table base or a lamp or whatever, you know. You'd probably have about a thousand people that would love to give you their buckthorn yeah. to use. 
<laughs> yeah, but they're never big enough. They, they're just small ones. How do you have to um, harvest and prepare the, the wood in order to be able to use it? I, I don't like cutting down live trees. I'm not a tree hugger, but I have so many trees that I just can't see cutting them down. So what we've, what got me started was in 2014, I think we had a, a derecho that went through here. It was really bad winds. It blew down a lot of trees over by Garrettson and this whole area. And I lost about four big maple trees in the backwoods. There's 23 acres of jungle way back there. And the thing just lay in there. And in the past, I would just let them rot. But I saw so much neat wood in the, in the grains and burls and everything. So that's what prompted me to buy a sawmill and get to process all this wood. So in a way, all I've done is went from one type of farming to another to sustainably harvesting uh, wood off my own property. Then do you have to let it dry too so that it doesn't yeah. crack and cure? Ideally you want a uh, kiln for drying it, but I have a hoop house. It's a 30 by 96 and it gets up to about 120, 130 in there. And we raised tomatoes in it and what have you. Well, it's also a good place to put a whole stack of lumber and it dries out really fast in there. Like how long do you have to put it in there to, eat, well, to let it dry? We start using, they say if you're going to air dry it, it should be a year for every inch of thickness. And typically like this, this slab here is two and a half inches thick. We did a, uh, two bar tops for a restaurant in town called Bread and Circus. And those are out of hard, rock hard maple. Those I dried, I believe it was about two years, in the hoop house. And they've never twisted or uh, checked since we put those in. So we found that's pretty accurate, but uh, about a year per inch. When you, you use a sawmill then mm -hmm. to cut your slabs, right. then do you debark them too? A lot of, yeah, a lot of times the bark is already falling off. So we just cut them. A lot of times, uh, if you cut your slabs and just leave the bark on there, there's still going to be some work that the worms will do, and they will make a real cool etching and grooves on your uh, live edge. So we don't want to remove the bark until we absolutely have to. So, so what kind of woods do we have here? Uh, I've got uh, black walnut from the farm here. This one is a honey locust. Uh, it makes makes for a, it makes a good uh, cutting boards, but it's just really hard to work with. I mean, it's in what way? But it's actually even harder than the oaks. It's harder than this, and it's harder than the maple. And then this is more walnut. Here, what we we do a lot of times whenever we've got an imperfection in the wood, we'll put uh, clear epoxy with real uh, turquoise in it. We can get powdered turquoise out of Arizona, and then we mix it and put it in. I love maple because it's got so many different things and it gets spalting in it, which is caused by the sugars coming up in the, it's, it's actually the first stage of uh, decay that starts in a tree. It makes for a real cool looking uh, wood. I have uh, those two fish that we were looking at in there. That's the spalting. Okay, then how do you cut the wood? Uh, with a saber saw or a jigsaw. I use a plane, but it's mostly sanding. What do you use to coat and protect it then? We, I like using a marine finish on all of the tables and the bar tops and that type of thing, because you never, never know when people are going to put them outside. I've built two tiki bars. In fact, I got a tiki bar over there. And we have one at Lake Hendrix that we has been out. It's been through four winters up there. And it still looks like the day that we put it up there. And that one's maple and walnut. What is that lamp that's behind you? What's that made out of? This lamp is, uh, if I can grab a hold of him, this is uh, American elm. And then the top of it is uh, just a limb of 
from a maple tree that went down in the backwoods and it was too intriguing not to do something with it. It is beautiful. It's so interesting. Now, how do you add this color to your wood? I get the clear epoxy, the two-part epoxy that, oh, it takes about 24 hours to set, but you've only got about 30 minutes to work with it. And then I put uh, either acrylic stain in it or eh, you can put a lot of different things to stain it, but there's stain that you can buy different colors and then just mix it and try and make it like waves or whatever. So it's unlimited what you can do. For a beautiful table like this, about how many hours does it take you to make that? This guy um, is about 20 to 24 hours, I think. The philosophy that we have in making this stuff is, I just like making it. And whether it sells or not, that's, that's beside the point. And you don't keep track of your time, because if you did, then it's a job. <laughs> so you do sell yeah. your product? Oh, yeah. How do you market it? Uh, mostly in festivals. We just had a festival last week, and that was the Sidewalk Arts Festival in Sioux Falls. And it's a one-day deal. Uh, we did pretty well. We sold, I think, four or five tables and about 40 boards. A lot of times we do custom work, too. Sometimes uh, you've got to pace yourself and enjoy it. Otherwise, it becomes a job if, it's, if you're making it for somebody, you know. I'd rather just make it and present it, and if they like it, great. If not, it goes back in the studio. <laughs> Well, thank you mm -hmm. so much You're for welcome. letting us come out and see your fruit and your mushrooms and your beautiful woodworking too. You're welcome, yeah. Thanks for coming. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided by Heartland Motor Company, providing service to Minnesota and the Dakotas for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA, pioneers in bringing state-of-the-art technology to our rural communities. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. And by friends of Prairie Yard and Garden, a community of supporters like you who engage in the long-term growth of the series. To become a friend of Prairie Yard and Garden, visit pioneer.org forward slash PYG.